Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mohsin Ahmed Sheikh, and today we are going to talk about uh, best practices for distributed deep learning on IBEX. And with me today are uh, Dr. David Gill and Glennon Hall. Uh, and together we are going to talk about uh, different sections of the training. And the so first, uh, we'll uh, try and uh, describe a little bit what is involved in distributed deep, deep learning and uh, oh, why would we do distributed deep learning. Moving on, uh, David is going to talk about how to do Horoward on uh, IVEX. And then uh, finishing off, we'll uh, finish up with uh, some best practices, including uh, scaling the deep learning on IVEX. Um, so essentially, uh, to start with, uh, distributed deep learning is enabled by uh, three different uh, opportunities um, that are presented in three different uh, uh, ecosystems. And when combined together, it enables distributed deep learning. Uh, the first one is potential parallelism in the um, in the algorithm itself, uh, the serial algorithm, one GPU uh, training job that you're running. And there are hotspots in there that can be uh, paralyzed and leveraging those can actually uh, make a difference in terms of the speed up that you get uh, to complete your training jobs. Uh, for that, you require a special hardware features and those special hardware features are uh, exploited uh, very nicely by third party libraries that are already there and including the frameworks. So combined together, uh, this actually gives us the opportunity to um, uh, enable distributed deep learning on uh, special architectures with uh, third party libraries. When you do this, when you go through all that pain to change uh, your scripts and um, uh, run it on multiple GPUs, several multiple GPUs, then uh, what you can get at the end of the day is uh, a decent uh, uh, and significant speed up in your training jobs. And here it is an example uh, of uh, PyTorch. Uh, we are running 1.5.1 in this uh, situation with Horoward. And what we are trying to do is we're trying to uh, train uh, ResNet 50 on ImageNet 2012, uh, a 1K um, data set, 1,000 classes data set. Uh, we're keeping the uh, batch size to 256, fixed to 256, and we run uh, 90 epochs uh, for the whole training. The target uh, top one accuracy that we were after for the single GPU was uh, just about 76%. We ended up at 75, and then uh, uh, the uh, validation was 71.9%. And uh, running it on 32 GPUs on four uh, nodes of IBEX, um, we got a very significant speed up uh, where the 90 epochs actually finished in five hours uh, and with uh, not a, that much of a deterioration in the uh, accuracy. Now, uh, this speed up uh, means that you can do your scientific experimentations faster and make more mistakes to actually get to the right uh, answer. So training on one GPU, what does it involve? Well, you start with a, a CPU workload where you extract, uh, i.e. ingest uh, the uh, images from disk. Um, you may transform those uh, and, and then uh, that also happens on CPUs. And then uh, that transformed uh, set of images is batched together and then loaded into GPU memory. Then you move on to um, uh, a forward pass. Uh, basically uh, here, uh, activations are evaluated on uh, multiple uh, layers uh, and then uh, one by one. And um, once those are done, uh, you will estimate your first uh, error. Uh, and then uh, you'll evaluate the loss function that you have chosen for that error, with that error. And this is pretty much, um, I mean, uh, straightforward uh, and independent, uh, doesn't require any information um, or serialization per se. In uh, back propagation, however, uh, you calculate the gradients of loss function from each layer, and then each layer, uh, each, uh, each layer, current layer, present layer that uh, is in focus requires information from the previous layer in this situation. So basically one thing that is 
for sure is uh, in back propagation uh, you uh, need uh, if you split this operation and put it on multiple gpus you need synchronization and that's exactly what you will see in a bit following the back propagation basically you will do your optimization step if you're for instance doing sgd you will do your optimization and then uh, update your weights uh, and go back to the next iteration so how would you do that on multiple gpus well um, the uh, extract uh, transform load step on cpus can actually be parallelized uh, which means to say uh, if you have a, a bunch of data uh, you can split that data and, and um, let uh, different CPUs uh, address different uh, chunk of the data uh, and uh, do the forward pass. Uh, basically, every GPU does the forward pass independently. And do, when doing the backward, uh, back propagation, uh, what they need to then do is because the uh, following layer uh, requires uh, information from the preceding layer, they need to synchronize after doing the gradient uh, evaluation on each uh, layer. And that's exactly what happened. Um, um, the synchronization step requires uh, intervention or usage of uh, some sort of communication between the two GPUs. And uh, we will see that too uh, in a bit. Uh, uh, what are the options uh, for using something like that? But if you do that, then you have uh, practically enabled uh, uh, an ecosystem where you can actually uh, pin uh, some work to the GPUs. Here, one thing to remember is that right from the beginning until the end, the intention is to keep the model the same on every GPU. That means you're doing this so that when you end up here after every batch, you end up with the same model. And in essence, that is uh, that is called uh, single program multiple data. And uh, this kind of programming model is uh, uh, very, uh, very often mapped onto something called uh, a distributed memory machine. Here, you have a lot of data and uh, you have the same model. So basically what you want is you want to increase the memory footprint uh, somehow. And uh, distributed memory machines are very cheap way of doing things. But the scenario or challenge that they, impo uh, they pose is that every machine has its own compute and its own memory address space. And the only way to move the data from one memory address space to the other memory address space is through the communication network. And this network needs to be very high speed because it has to keep up with this bandwidth that is between uh, the local uh, resources. So SPMD or single program multiple data is the way to go uh, in this scenario in terms of programming something like this to exhibit what's called data parallelism where you have the same program, in our case, the same model, but we are going to feed them with different batches, i.e. we are going to try and parallelize the whole data set and uh, more, uh, do, uh, do the training onto multiple GPUs. The advantage, uh, disadvantage of this is, it is a bit uh, tricky when you are coding uh, something of this sort, uh, but it, is, uh, it, it has its upside that you can now scale to a large number of CPUs or GPUs. So it's highly scalable. De facto method of uh, communication, as I mentioned, the communication network, and in order to move data on that communication uh, network is, uh, the, the solution to that is a library called message passing interface. Most of the time uh, it is, um, it is a library, it's, it's actually a standard, and there are vendor libraries that follow that standard. And uh, MPI is basically a collection of uh, functions uh, to communicate between processes uh, running on different uh, compute units. And the uh, whole ethos of uh, its existence basically is uh, that um, it uh, allows you to move data from one memory address space to other memory address space. There's C, C++, Fortran, and Python binding available for uh, this library. And the idea is that 
one process, one MPI process sends a message, the other one receives that message, but the operation does not end until both of uh, the uh, contributing processes have finished in doing their bit. And this is why sometimes these operations are called uh, blocking operations. Talking about MPI uh, is important because this, the concepts in MPI and the communication patterns in the MPI are uh, reused or are uh, repurposed uh, by frameworks like Horowart, for instance, or even PyTorch's distributed data parallel. So let's look at an example of how to do MPI in Python, for instance. Here, we, are, we have a very small code snippet uh, where we are first loading the environment, and then we are querying the environment, uh, querying the environment such that uh, in the software scope, what is the handle I'm going to use to communicate between the processes? Who am I amongst all of the existing processes? And what is the total number of processes uh, that have been launched uh, with, with this um, program? Then each process runs a random number generation uh, in an array of size four, and then everyone prints their own data. When we run this on four processes, what we see is each one of them runs the same program, but have different rank IDs and know that they know that there are four of them that have started, but each of them generate a different data. That's fantastic. Now we have four times the memory almost per process, and uh, we may have GPUs uh, 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 pinned to each process as well. So we, we may have four GPUs that we can use. But right now we don't have any means as yet to uh, move this data from one process, let's say, to the other. And that's where the communication patterns come in. And I'm going to talk about the collective communication patterns in MPI, which are more relevant to us in, uh, from a distributed deep learning perspective. The first communication pattern I'm going to talk about is called broadcast. Here, the uh, root rank or one of the ranks has the data and the intention is that this same data ends up on all the ranks. Here in an, in, in an example, what we are doing is we are querying the um, uh, environment uh, at the startup and then only rank zero generates some data. And then everyone calls this broadcast function with the information that the sender is going to be root rank. And once this is completed, we then print the data in the array X for everyone. And we can see that all of the processes, all of the ranks, MPI ranks, end up with the same data. And this was the essence of broadcast from get-go. The next relevant uh, functionality or pattern is MPI gather. And here, what we intend to do is, uh, processes have their own data. And what they want to do is they want to bring that whole data onto one process. Now, uh, in this situation, all the ranks will create a single element of data, which is going to be different from one another. And then they are going to call uh, the API gather. They're going to send the data and they're going to tell where the data will end up and also to which rank you have to gather all the data on. Once this runs, basically what you can see is all the ranks generated their own data and rank zero ended up with all the data in the sequence of uh, uh, the indices of the array corresponding to the ranks that have sent the data. So rank zero sent five and it ended in the index zero of this array. The uh, opposite to uh, gather obviously is scatter, and this operation does exactly uh, what it, um, in terms of op opposite it says, um, that uh, one rank has all the data, and it wants to scatter the data such that uh, some relevant uh, chunk of data goes to each process. In this situation, rank zero creates some data, and then all of the contributing ranks 
basically um, all of the contributing rank, ranks basically um, scatter the data onto ranks uh, from rank zero or, uh, to everyone. And here we see rank zero created some data. And then once this scatter instruction ended, finished, uh, we ended up with uh, one element each on each rank for each process. Another relevant um, communication pattern is reduce. Sometimes you are not interested in the whole data, but uh, a uni unique value that uh, is probably coming out of doing an operation on the data itself. Say for instance, in this situation, we are summing the data that is on all the processes and uh, bringing that sum onto one process that is effectively uh, called uh, reduction. So basically here, uh, all the processes generate some data and uh, everyone calls the MPI reduce and tells that rank zero needs to get the answer after the summation of all the data, because that's what you're interested in. Here, when we run it with four MPI processes uh, and all re a reduce uh, program, all the processes run the same program and end up with different data generated and then once the reduction happens, the rank zero ends up with the sum of all the data that was on all the processes. Now, to broaden uh, the scope of it, you might want that not only rank zero, but everyone participating in the MPI process should end up with the sum. And that's, that can be achieved with uh, what's called all reduce. So all the processes generate their own data, and then they call this all reduce functionality with uh, MPI sum. Here, there is no significance of uh, passing the root because the intention is that all of the processes will have the sum at the end. And this is exactly what's happening. This is the actual data generated, and this is the print of the resulting, uh, the resulting or the reduced uh, value. And every process has the same value. And if you look at all reduce, it is really um, intuitive to uh, think that it will apply uh, to when we are doing back, back propagation uh, of our multi GPU example uh, layer wise to update the weights. Here it is an example uh, of our uh, AI node on IBEX, which has uh, uh, V100s, eight V100s. And uh, uh, in this situation, we have two socket uh, CPU. Each socket has uh, 24 cores. And if you see that there are uh, connections between CPU and GPU via this uh, purple lane called PCIe Express Lane. And PCIe Express Lane is not dedicated for that uh, uh, traffic because it is also establishing communication with let's say local storage, or a network interface card with, uh, which allows you to communicate to the outside world, that is the other, uh, the other nodes. There is another uh, route of communication uh, in the hardware, that is uh, the NVLink. This is a proprietary uh, communication fabric that uh, NVIDIA has provided to connect GPUs. The whole idea of this, its existence is to bypass the CPU and the PCI Express. And I'll tell you in, a, uh, in the next slide why. The reason for doing that is these capabilities of the bandwidth, theoretical maximum bandwidth. If you look at PCI Express, the maximum bandwidth it can offer you is 15 gigabytes per second, right? Whereas, NVIDIA's NVLink has a bi-directional bandwidth of 50 gigabytes per second. NVIDIA also offered something called a GPU Direct RDMA, which enables communication directly from GPU memory to uh, the outside world through this network interface card. Now we have four network interface cards connected to this PCI Express bus each having a capability of 
12 gigabytes per second, which means an aggregate of 48 gigabytes per second is available on a single node to communicate with the outside world. But we are still going to use PCIe Express to push the batches from CPU after the uh, extract transform load step onto the GPU memory. So still the PCIe Express bus uh, bandwidth applies here, which is by the way, not dedicated to this operation only, but is talking to the mix as well as the local storage. And uh, you're always going to um, use the uh, local storage, uh, PCIe Express um, traffic for local storage because your data is there and CPU is supposed to read it. So uh, most of the time, um, and I'm pretty sure that everyone is doing it already, um, you will be doing multi-threading on uh, IO and uh, doing some transforms and uh, creating the patches. Uh, and it, it is a good idea because here, what you'll be doing is you'll not be, uh, you'll not be imposing the weight uh, for the GPU, which is very, very fast uh, to compute compared to uh, CPUs. Uh, and I specialized for some tasks, you will not impose any wait uh, time uh, before the next batches are pushed into the GPU memory. You will be pipelining them through that multi-threading. So it's a very good idea. So essentially, uh, the message from this um, slide is that once the uh, batches are uh, sent in, um, what would you, you would try to do is uh, to have a maximum residence time, either on the GPU or if you had to communicate, you would be communicating between the GPUs through that NV, uh, NV link. Now, uh, that implies that the frequency with which you are sending the batches kind of uh, is controlled. And the way of doing it is large batch size. Now, that green path that I showed you requires uh, a, a specific library called Nickel, and Nickel stands for NVIDIA's uh, Collective Communication Library. It's a, it's a proprietary library which allows uh, using the NVLINKS bandwidth and bypasses the PCIe. Uh, but if NVLINK is not there, um, it, will, it will also do peer-to-peer -peer over PCIe Express. It has integration with uh, TensorFlow, PyTorch, MXNet, Chainer, uh, Cafe2. Um, it allows, uh, it has a decent um, uh, functionality, uh, uh, which can be used out of the box in a single line for collectives, for example, all reduce. And uh, a good thing about uh, Nickel is that when you are using one GPU and you want to use multiple GPUs, basically you can uh, use Nickel. And with the same library, you can uh, use, by using GPU uh, direct RDMA, you can go out from one node to multiple nodes to actually use more than the GPUs that you have on one node, which actually bypasses the CPU path. So bringing it all together, basically you uh, will do some extract load and transform on CPUs. And those uh, CPUs will push batches onto the GPUs with parameters that are, the, that are same right at the beginning. So model will be the same on all the GPUs. And once they have, uh, once they have evaluated their own local gradients, uh, and nickel will be called and all reduce uh, operation will happen where averaging of all these um, gradients will happen and uh, the model will end up with the same gradients on all the GPUs and then you move uh, to the next batch. Now, what does Horoward do? Where does Horoward fit here? As I mentioned before, from the looks of it, there was quite a lot of heavy lifting in terms of implementing this SPMD or single program multiple data. Um, Horoward, like PyTorch's uh, distributed uh, data parallel, hides quite a lot of complexity from the user and allows the implementation of single program multiple data uh, from a framework point of view out of the box as a turnkey solution. And it has uh, support, it supports TensorFlow Keras, uh, PyTorch, 
and MXNet at the moment. And it can communicate on nickel, MPI, or TCP IP, depending on which kind of uh, connectivity you have between the GPUs. So at the end of the day, uh, Horoward is a, 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 a framework which sits on top of the frameworks, uh, deep learning frameworks you're familiar with and is capable of using the fabric that is underlying on your, uh, um, th that is connecting your um, hardware resource. So once you do that, basically, you can go from one GPU and one node to multiple GPUs uh, on multiple nodes with the same script. And I am uh, showing you here um, the same example of ResNet 50 being trained on ImageNet 2012 uh, with the same batch size. So the batch size is kept constant from one GPU to uh, 32 GPUs. Uh, and we ran the training for 10 epochs and you can see significant uh, uh, gains in the uh, training time. Now, uh, one thing that also happens here is that uh, the batch size, because it is constant per GPU, your batch size, total global batch size is increasing. So you are actually exposing your model uh, to, the, to larger data all at the same time. So, I think I'll uh, break here and uh, uh, invite David uh, to talk about how to do horror wall. Thanks, Mosin. Actually, before you go, there is a, a question for you in the Q and A. Yeah. Yes. So the question is, uh, any any difference between gather plus sum on root and reduce terms of architecture? Uh, no. Basically. Um, I think Saber is uh, typing the answer to. So essentially reduce basically is uh, uh, what you just mentioned. It gathers and sums uh, behind the curtain. And, and it, it is kind of uh, doing it uh, in an optimal manner. And this is where the differences come between how this is implemented. And nickel, why is it used? Is it, it is used because some people have dedicated uh, their time to actually optimize that. Uh, those steps um, to to get get this done in a very quick manner. Uh, there is another question: Is one GPU in one node directly connected to one GPU on the other node via NV link so that they can communicate very fast? Uh, no, they are not communicating communicating over NV link if they are on two different nodes. They have to go through this network interface card onto something called InfiniBand, right? But the uh, good part here is that now you don't have to go via CPU outside uh, to the outside world via in, in, uh, network, network interface card. Um, what you can do is the GPU memory can send the data via GPU direct RDMA directly to the, to, to the, to the outside world, to the NIC. I hope that answers the question. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. David Pugh. I am a staff scientist at the Cal's Visualization Core Laboratory. And as Mosin said, I'm going to kind of talk you through uh, what I think is the best practice for getting started with Horovod uh, on IBEX. So um, what is Horovod? So if you're not familiar, so Horovod is uh, one of the leading open source frameworks for doing large scale uh, deep learning. It was originally developed uh, at Uber, uh, of all places, um, a few years ago, and then it was recently open sourced uh, as a library that's now managed by the Linux Foundation. Um, when Horovod came around, there were um, not a lot of kind of general purpose uh, frameworks for supporting large scale distributed deep learning. You had to do a lot of the um, implementation of the low-level primitives that Mosin walked you through in his talk. Um, you had to do that yourself. Um, you had to do it for each model. Um, some of the frameworks, uh, TensorFlow had some support for, uh, for doing this, but it tended to only scale um, to either all your GPUs on a single node or it, it scaled um, very poorly across multiple GPUs on multiple nodes. So Horovod, 
uh, was really quite a big step forward uh, when it came out uh, and was open source. And it, as, it, um, as most have mentioned, the scaling performance is, is quite good. You know, when you, particularly when you um, use uh, RDMA and GPU direct, you know, it can scale from one to hundreds, uh, even thousands of GPUs, I think now in the largest examples that have been made with quite high scaling efficiency. So what's nice about Horovod is that for you as a user is that it integrates quite, um, quite easily with TensorFlow, Keras, PyTorch, or Apache MXNet. So whether it doesn't really matter what um, kind of deep learning framework you're using, it integrates, Horovod can integrate with it. So you don't have to change your code uh, too much uh, in order to leverage Horovod. Um, and it's quite portable. So the, the same kind of approach that I'm going to walk you through here, um, you, can, um, you can use on IBEX. Uh, you can also move it into a, a public cloud uh, setup um, because we're going to be building this in a Conda environment and you can just kind of transition that Conda environment back and forth. So um, some key concepts for Horvod. So um, the first is a host. So the Horvod uh, training job is going to run on one or more hosts. So um, one of these hosts will be kind of the root host. And on IBEX, this is going to be the host on which your, uh, your job script is going to run. So that will be the root host. And that root host is going to be responsible for coordinating uh, some communication with the other hosts. And, um, and also will be doing things like checkpointing or interacting with TensorBoard or, or things like this. Um, and note that a single host will often contain multiple GPUs. So we have uh, on our eight V100 nodes, there are obviously eight GPUs per node. So that would be eight GPUs per host uh, in this case. So in addition to hosts, you have the concept of a task. And so Horovod uses MPI to launch a separate task for each GPU. So the total number of tasks launched is going to equal the total number of GPUs that you're using for training. So a single GPU job with Horovod would basically have a single host, which would be the root host on which your job script would run on IBEX. And if you're only using a single GPU, Horovod will spawn a single task, which will map that one GPU to your deep learning kind of workflow. But then as you expand and you add more GPUs uh, and potentially more nodes, then the number of tasks uh, just increases as you add additional GPUs and you don't have to change anything about your code. So Horovod handles all of the communications both within a single node or within a single host and across nodes and, or across hosts. So that's a really great feature of Horovod is that it's a, it's a method for going from one to N GPUs where N can be, you know, two, four, eight, you know, 16, so on and so forth, all the way up to thousands of GPUs. Okay, so the third key concept is the global rank. And so MPI, so this is another kind of MPI concept. So MPI assigns each task a unique integer. So this is going to go from zero uh, to the Slurm number of tasks. So this would be the number of tasks that you ask Slurm to spawn as part of your job. And remember, the number of tasks also maps to the number of GPUs that you're, you're spawning. So really, MPI is going to assign each task or each GPU a unique, a unique integer to differentiate from all the other tasks that are being launched by MPI across the various hosts. So that's the global rank. The local rank is the uh, unique integer that's assigned to each task on each node. So you need kind of two numbers to differentiate each task or each GPU. You need a number that is a local to the node or the host number, that's the local rank. And then you need a global rank, which is unique across all of the tasks which are distributed across all of the nodes in the cluster or in the, in the, the nodes that you've been allocated via Slurm. Okay, so those are four key, um, key ideas. And here's kind of a graphic that explains how these pieces fit together. So here we have two hosts, host zero and host one. Now host zero would be your root host. This would be the, the node 
on which your Slurm job script would be run. And in your Slurm job script, there would be an MPI run command. And this MPI run command is going to um, spawn some number of tasks. In this case, four tasks distributed across two hosts. And each of those tasks is going to have a global rank and a local rank. So the global rank of the task is what differentiates uh, or uniquely identifies the tasks across all the hosts. So here we have rank zero, one, two, and three. And then within a host or a node, you have also the local rank. So since we have, in this case, two GPUs per node, the local rank goes from zero to one on each node. And then of course we have the global rank, which goes from zero to four, okay? And you can see the, the, the pinning here where um, uh, Horovod will pin um, each GPU to a particular task. And so each GPU has its own unique local rank and then its own global rank. And then your, um, if you're working with TensorFlow or PyTorch, for example, your data loaders are going to be loading you know, these independent data parallel streams each feeding its own GPU. And then, um, as Mosin pointed out, um, the Nickel uh, communication library will be handling uh, the vast majority of the communication that's going on um, either between GPUs uh, in a single node or perhaps going through uh, GPU direct RDMA across uh, the barrier between hosts or nodes. Okay, so hopefully that we have those four key. Uh, key concepts down. Okay, so to get started with Horovod, you know, I would recommend that you create a Conda environment for Horovod. So this allows you to integrate your, um, integrate Horovod with whatever else you need as part of your uh, deep learning pipeline. So you, you very likely need more than, um, you know, just TensorFlow or PyTorch. You probably have a whole bunch of other libraries, maybe visualization libraries, other data analysis libraries, kind of domain specific libraries that you might need. And what you want to do is integrate Horvod within that, that software stack. And the easiest way to do that um, is Conda. And so um, there is some detailed documentation actually in Horvod uh, that I have uh, contributed to the project on how to uh, create Conda environments for Horovod. So you can uh, follow this link to the, that detailed documentation. Uh, we also have a, a project template GitHub repository, which I'll show you in a minute, that walks you through the, the details of, of creating the Conda environment. Um, but there are a few, um, a few key principles that I kind of want to touch on here. So the first is that um, you want to follow the, the Conda uh, plus PIP philosophy of using Conda wherever possible and PIP only where necessary. So um, Horovod is actually a package that needs to be installed with PIP. And that's because at least at the moment, there are no pre-compiled binaries available for Horovod. So you're going to need to compile um, the Horovod uh, extensions for whichever framework you're using um, at, the time of the, at the time you create the Conda environment. And so you're going to need to install Horovod via PIP in order to do that. Now, um, this is also one of the, the few cases where you actually want to combine modules with Conda. So typically on IBEX, you're either going to go in one or two directions. You're either going to use modules or you're going to use Conda and Conda environments. But this is actually one of the cases where it's OK to use both. So you will use the uh, module load CUDA to get the version of um, of the NVCC compiler, as well as the CUDA runtime libraries, but you'll actually be using the NVCC compiler from the CUDA module to compile the extension, the CUDA extensions for TensorFlow or PyTorch that Horovod needs in order to, to run. And I'll walk you through the, the, the project template on GitHub and show you kind of what I mean by this. So because you need to compile things, I find it very useful to not create your Conda environment for Horovod on a login node. The, most, uh, the best way to consistently build your Conda environment for Horovod is to actually launch the Conda environment creation process as a job on IBEX 
on the batch partition or maybe on the debug partition and specifically ask for V100 GPUs to make sure that your job lands on a node where you have V100 GPUs. So when you compile and NVCC picks up information about the compute capabilities of, uh, of the GPU on the system when it does this comp compilation, you're using the V100s because you're only going to want to use the V100s when you're working with Horovod because of the NVLink uh, support with between the GPUs on individual nodes. That's very important. And the environment creation JavaScript is, is another one of the files that's available in the, in the template repo. Okay, so there are a few modifications that you need to make um, when you're modifying a training script for Horovod. Um, so the first is that, um, you're going to want to initialize Horovod. So you do this in your Python training script. So you'll be initializing Horovod at the very top of your Python training script. Um, and that just sets up Horovod so that it can communicate with the, between the different tasks and things like that. Um, you have to pin your training process in that script to a particular GPU, which will be the GPU that is assigned by Slurm to the particular task associated with that running of the script. Um, you have to set up a distributed sampler for your data. So this is very similar to what you would do with um, PyTorch or, or TensorFlow. Then you have to wrap your optimizer to make it a distributed optimizer. So Horovod does this for you. You just have to use its, its wrapper function to do that. And then you have to pick a particular task to be responsible for doing things like synchronizing states uh, between other tasks and then doing things like checkpointing, tensor board logging, things like this. And usually you just pick the global rank zero task and make that the task responsible for all these things. And um, there are some uh, examples on GitHub that have framework specific implementation details. Okay, so in the, uh, the Horovod template project, I have some job, some example job submission scripts. Um, I've put some kind of high level hints here um, or things that are, I think are important. So uh, the first is that, and this is more of a Conda, uh, Conda tip, not Horovod specific, that if you want to use the Conda activate command from within your job script, then you need to run your job script as a login shell. So that's using, um, you know, hash exclamation point slash bin bash dash dash login. So this is important. Um, and you should be using the conda activate command. I see a lot of users using source activate, but that syntax is going to be deprecated in the newer versions of conda. So you, you need to transition to the conda activate command. Um, so the defaults are for Slurm are going to be one node. And then if you ask for GPU, it's going to be one GPU per node. So that would only be a single GPU job. So what you do is you control the number of GPUs by either uh, the way that I do it is either increasing the number of nodes. So if you add just more nodes, then you get basically one GPU on each node and you could go to two nodes or four nodes or eight nodes or 16 nodes or something like that. So I think of that as being horizontal scaling or you increase the number of tasks per node. And since Horvath is going to map each task to a GPU, then increasing the number of tasks per node is also increasing the number of GPUs per node. And so that's kind of a vertical scaling. Um, or you can do both. I typically do uh, vertical scaling first, followed by kind of horizontal scaling. So if I really want to, I will go to eight GPUs on a single node, and then I will basically say, okay, now I need two nodes with eight GPUs on each node or something, something like this. Um, but you can do combinations of both. That's one of the nice features of, of, of Horvath. And you want to give uh, your CPUs per GPU and memory per GPU uh, appropriate defaults, and then these don't need to change in your in your Slurm script. So, for for me, for the V100s, I typically will set um, my CPUs per GPU to be six, and then uh, memory per GPU, I would do a minimum of uh, two times the uh, GPU memory, which for the V100s is 32 gigs. So that would be a, min a minimum of 64 gigs of memory per GPU and as high as maybe 92 uh, gigs of memory per, per GPU. So now uh, what I want to do is I want to walk you through the template repo a little bit, just show you kind of where these files are. So if you visit the Calst uh, Visualization Core Lab GitHub page, 
then there's a number of template repos uh, for different uh, machine learning or deep learning projects. So the one we're going to focus on today is the Horovod GPU data science project. So if you click on that, you'll be taken to the template repo. And you can you know, um, use this template repo by either um, clicking this use this template button, which will copy the entire contents uh, of this repo under your own GitHub user. You could also fork the repo um, if you wanted to uh, contribute uh, to developing the template repo project. Um, or you could, those would be the two ways that, that you, could, you could use it. So the configuration files for the Conda environment are here in this environment.yaml and there's requirements.txt. And I'll just briefly walk, walk you through this. So we have three channels. So PyTorch, Conda Forge, and defaults. And then followed by the, the dependencies that we need. And so here I've put kind of the, the, the bare minimum for PyTorch and TensorFlow um, and uh, MXNet. So, and I'm going to pick a very new version of CUDA. So CUDA Toolkit 11 and CUDNN 8. And it will be very important that the module version of CUDA that I load matches the version that I have here in, uh, in my environment file, because I need to get the compiler from, that, um, from the, the CUDA module. And when I compile, I need to compile um, to make sure that the, the versions are matching. So I need, I'll do, need to do module load CUDA 11 in order to get the NVCC compiler that will be consistent with the CUDA runtime libraries that I'm getting from, from Conda. Now, here I'm also getting Nickel uh, from Conda. I'm also getting uh, an open MPI, uh, a CUDA aware uh, open MPI. So when I use MPI run, I'm going to be using the MPI run um, from within Conda, not the MPI that is installed on, on IBEX. Um, I'm also going to be getting my compilers, my C++ compilers from Conda as well. So everything is coming within Conda except for the NVIDIA CUDA compiler. And what makes the Conda environment aware of the system installed NVIDIA CUDA compiler is this special meta package here, which basically all it does is trick your Conda environment to think that your system installed NVCC is actually installed inside of your Conda environment. There's another little conda trick here. So inside my pip section, I have this little neat syntax here, which basically will allow conda to call out via pip and install the pip dependencies that I have listed in this requirements.txt file, which includes Horvod and then um, a JupyterLab MP dashboard, which is a GPU, uh, CPU, and memory resource monitoring tool. Uh, which I encourage everyone to use. And there's a, another little pip trick, which is that because we want to make sure Horovod gets recompiled every time we rebuild the environment, just for um, consistency sake, we can add this no binary equals Horovod to make sure that pip always doesn't use any caches or anything like that. It always will recompile everything whenever we rebuild the environment. This means that environment builds take longer, but you build environments much less frequently uh, or, or relatively infrequently. And by recompiling everything, every time you build your content environment, it just gives you better, um, better consistency over the environment in, in my experience. Now, if you go into the, the, the bin directory, you'll find examples of um, Horvod uh, training jobs, as well as the Conda environment creation scripts. And um, this Conda create environment sbatch script is the one that you'll want to launch to create your Conda environment. And if you look in here, it's basically just going to ask for um, fairly minimal resources, a single V100 GPU, six CPU, 64 gigs of memory for two hours. And then it's going to make sure that NVCC is available and then run the shell script, which will just build the Conda environment. And then um, I've also added here some scripts for like a generic training job, a single node training job, and a multiple node training job. I'll probably be condensing these into a single script um, in the future that you just use this single script. Um, but if I take a look at the single node job, for example, you can see the slurm headers. So 
we have uh, GPUs per node and then tasks per node. Those will always be set to be the same. And then these never change for horizontal. You have GPUs per task is one, then CPUs per GPU and men per GPU. Um, those are always the same. And then the rest of this script is just setting things up like um, um, logging directories on um, the local node and on your scratch directory, and then doing things like setting up or activating your conda environment, um, starting your NV dashboard monitoring server, starting up TensorBoard, using the Horovod run runner to, um, to run your single node training job, um, doing things like checkpointing and copying over your checkpoints um, from the local node to your scratch directories and things like this. Um, all of those are more generic kind of uh, ideas for uh, training, not so much related to, to Horovod. Okay, so I think that's about all that I have. I just wanted to make you aware of this Horovod template and kind of really encourage you to use Horovod. Um, if you're not completely sold on Horovod, um, the two other alternatives that I think worth mentioning are, um, so PyTorch has their distributed deep learning um, module. Um, and that's the one that PyTorch is, is pushing um, everyone to use if you're kind of PyTorch, that would be their distributed deep learning. It also has an MPI um, backend um, and also uses Nickel. Um, but as far as the benchmarks that I have seen, it is slower than, uh, than Horvath. Um, the other option, which I think is uh, something that I'm looking into as well, is um, DeepSpeed, which is a Microsoft uh, large-scale distributed training. Um, it's newer, a little bit newer than Horvod. Um, it's only been out for, um, I'm not even sure it's been out for a year yet, um, but it looks uh, quite promising as well and uh, uses many of the same ideas, frankly, as Horvod. It's going to use MPI and and nickel and, and all of these things. Um, it just has you know, its own slightly different uh, you know, syntax and way of setting it up and things like that. So if you look in the source directory of this, um, of the template repo, and uh, there is a PyTorch examples image net train.py. Okay, so this is a training script which I adapted from one of the Horvod um, official uh, examples and it does, you know, a lot of best practices like using arg parse to expose um, all of these uh, command line arguments so that you can uh, configure the behavior of your training job from the command line when you launch your jobs on IBEX. So that's a gen generic good practice. But here are things that you need to change. So you need to initialize Horvod. And actually, this is one line, horvod.init. Well, well, maybe two if you count the import statement up here. So here's your from Horvod import Horvod dot whatever. So this, in this case, it's PyTorch, so it would be Horvod dot torch. So if you're doing, um, um, if you're doing TensorFlow, it would be Horvod dot uh, uh, TensorFlow uh, as uh, HVD. And then, or I don't, I'm not sure anyone is using Apache Emacs net. So you've got your import statement plus this Horvod in it. So two lines to initialize Horvod. Um, here is where we pin the GPU to the local rank. So from Horovod is where we get information about global rank and local rank because Horovod is MPI aware. And so it's, it will pick up that information from, from MPI when you initialize your, your training job. And so we want to tell PyTorch to only use a specific GPU. And then MPI is going to run this script however many times there are, or it's going to run this script, you know, n times if there are n tasks, because that's the way that the NPI run command, uh, command will work. And so for each task, we want to pin that to a particular GPU on a particular node. So we can do that with the horovod.local rank. And then if we go down a little bit further, we can find, so a lot of this is just generic uh, training stuff. So if we go, okay, so here, so here I have my, 
my typical PyTorch data loaders, data sets and data loaders. Um, and I take those, or sorry, data sets, and then I wrap those data sets and create a uh, distributed samplers. So this is um, also from PyTorch. But here I have to basically tell the distributed sampler something about how many GPUs I'm using. So the number of replicas needs to equal the number, the global number of tasks. And that's the total number of tasks that you're, you're starting up. And so that's the size and Horvod. And then um, you want to assign the, the rank for that distributed sampler to match the global rank for, um, um, from Horvod. So those are the, you have to make those changes there. And then the next big change is um, here. So after you've created your optimizer, you have to wrap it and to make it a distributed optimizer. And when you do the distributed, when you create the distributed optimizer, you can do some, some configuration. Like for example, you can decide to take a, um, to have your each individual task um, train for a certain number of batches before calling all reduce and synchronizing the uh, parameters across all of the tasks and all of the GPUs. So that's this batches per all reduce. So you can think of it as there's a certain amount of, of um, training that can go on individually for each task. And then every once in a while, you want to synchronize everything. Of course, you could synchronize after every batch. Or you could, you know, do quite a lot of training and then synchronize. Kind of depends on, on what you want to do, what your application wants to do, and things like that. Um, let's see. And here we have only the global uh, rank zero uh, task will be responsible for running this code, which basically restores from checkpoints um, and sets up TensorBoard logging and things like that. So only one task is responsible for doing that kind of stuff. And by convention, it's usually the rank zero task. And then um, we need to do a broadcast. So we have to broadcast all the parameters around from rank zero. And then, um, and that's, so that's basically what's going on here. So there's these three stages here is uh, the part of the broadcast. And then that's it. So there's, there's relatively little changes that need to be made you know, out of this script, which has approximately 300 lines of code, there might be two dozen lines of extra code that you have to add um, in order to make it uh, make it work. And the code that you would add is similar to, across the, the different um, frameworks. Awesome. That, thank you very much. Um, there's three questions in the chat, or maybe more. I'm okay. Down. I meant to answer Huang's first uh, question about do we create the environment every time we submit the job? So definitely not, because that takes just too, too long. Maybe you want to go through and answer the ones. And I see one there also that maybe a Mosin would be good to answer, but MP run and S run as well. Okay. So Glenn, and you answered Huang's question about, yeah, so we don't need to create the environment every time. Yep, definitely not. Only, only maybe only once, or then if you need to add different packages, then you'll need to go back and recreate the environment. But you only, if you've not added any packages or something like that, once you have a stable environment, then you don't need to, you need to recreate it again. Um, what is the difference between MPI run dash N and S run dash N? So I will make one comment about this and then most can add some, some extra, extra details. Um, when you are using Horovod and Conda, you will be using the, an open MPI implementation that is not Slurm aware and that is different than the system um, open MPI implementation um, that is pre-installed on IBEX. And so you'll need to use, um, when you use MPI run, you will be using, for sure within the Conda environment, you will be using the open MPI implementation that is installed within, uh, within Conda. If you're to use S run, then that S run will be using the OpenMPI implementation that is installed on the system within IBEX. And it's highly likely that you can get the, the two to work together. Um, it's just, I personally avoid trying to do that because I place a lot of, of value on portability. 
So I want to be able to know that I can more or less just take my script and, and my environment and move it off of IBEX somewhere else if I need to and run it on that other cluster. But Mosin will have some other like technical distinctions that he can, he can make about that. And then this last one, what if the model size is larger than a single V100 maximum memory size? How will Horvod distribute the model into multiple GPUs? So it looks like Mosin is also adding something. So Horvod is a, um, Horvod really focuses on data parallelism, not model parallelism. So if you have a model that needs to be distributed, is so large it needs to be distributed across multiple GPUs, then first I would ask you, are you willing to train with mixed precision? Because if you're willing to train with mixed precision, then that might reduce the size of your model down to where it can fit on a single GPU. So that would be the first thing that I would try. And if that still didn't work, then I would probably tell you to take a look at Microsoft Deep Speed because that's one of the differentiators between Microsoft Deep Speed and Horovod is that Microsoft Deep Speed, in addition to doing data parallel training, um, also has some fancy features for doing model parallel uh, and data parallel training. So if you need to, if you have some massive transformer model that simply won't fit on, on a 32 gig uh, B100, then you will need to split it up across multiple GPUs. Alternatively, um, you know, hopefully in the near future, we might have some more GPUs with larger memory and then it won't be a problem. And can you show us the steps about how to run this train.py with two to three GPU nodes in a terminal? So right this minute, I can't, unfortunately. So it's not something that I'm uh, prepared to do. However, I can commit to making a video and putting it on our YouTube channel on how to do that. At this point, I'm having a very large queue of, of requested YouTube videos. So I can't commit to a time frame for doing that, but I will, I will, I will make a video on how to do that at some point you know, within the next month or so. And then I'll get it up on the YouTube channel and spread it around Slack and everything when that's, when that's ready. David, if I remember, you yes. have a job script in your repo, so you can actually show that. Yes. So I do have a job. I, I do have a job script. And so if we look at the multiple node job with the multiple node job, all you're basically changing is the number of nodes. And then if you want to scale up vertically, you could add um, more GPUs per node and more tasks per node, but really you're just generally changing the number of nodes. And then you would just S batch this script and, uh, and that's it. So the, the rest of it is basically the same. Um, I've stripped, I think in this one, I've stripped out some of the, some extra stuff. And then you're using MPI run instead of Horvod run. The Horvod run command only tends to work on a single node. It should work in principle on a multiple node job, but what I found is just using MPI run is better. And so I, even on single node jobs now, I don't tend to use a uh, Horvod run. <laughs> when I, the, the things that caused me trouble when I was trying to get started with Horvod on multiple nodes was Slurm. It was getting the Slurm headers correct that caused a lot of, of consternation and delay. So I've figured out at least one way to, to do it. Um, and you know, it's, it's listed here. Thank you very much, David. That's fabulous. That's answered all the questions. Okay. So I'll share my screen and I'll start the next part. Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to our session. Thank you for attending and staying around. So we have, we've learned a lot of interesting things that are going to help us take advantage of the resources that IBEX has and do it effectively and efficiently. We have learned from Mosin a bit about how the architecture of the nodes and of IBEX, uh, what that is like, what's the amount of resources that IBEX has. We've learned also how the distributed processes are run and how they kind of integrate their answers back together with each other. And we've seen from uh, David's presentation how Horvod is a tool that is conceptually fairly simple and the amount of modifications that it requires to be made to your training code is, is fairly minimal. So it looks like the story is that you can get, you know, fabulous performance fairly easily with IBEX. So I'm here to talk about 
scaling. I'm, I'm here to say, hold on, not so fast. What I'm going to talk about today is uh, how to scale up your training so that you can actually get performance out of those resources. We're going to look at how we scale through batch sizes, how we can adjust our learning rates so that we get, so the performance is not just speed, but it's also, you know, accuracy, both for the training and for test, and look at some other opportunities to increase our efficiencies. So I want to start off with some kind of HPC intuitions. We're going to ask a little quiz. Um, so what is faster, you know, for the same GPU and workloads, one GPU, eight GPUs on one node, or 64 GPUs on eight nodes? We're not going to grade this. This is just kind of just to get your intuitions warmed up. So think about what answer feels right to you. How did you answer to yourself? Did you say, hey, that's not fair. That's not a good question. And that wasn't well formed. And, you know, it just depends. You know, IBEX is complex. <clears throat> My workflows are complex. There's lots of different variables, you know, uh, literally and figuratively, you know, who knows, right? So technically the truth, but that doesn't give us a lot of insight or understanding into how things might work or what we might expect. Another answer you might like as well, 64 GPUs, because like more is better right? Or maybe eight GPUs, because you think, well, you know, once you start crossing the network, then it's, you, know, you, you do see a bit of a performance hit. And you've certainly seen the performance numbers that Mosin showed this morning, where when you do start adding in more GPUs, you know, you get a significant boost to uh, performance and a significant reduction in your run times. But and it's, I don't think it, it came out in that presentation, but, you know, for like, 32 GPUs, you didn't get like a 32 times increase. You got like maybe like a 20 times increase. So the answer that I like is one GPU. And here's why. All the GPUs are the same. So all the GPUs have the same performance, right? Um, the difference in the 64 or 8 GPU case is that there's just more of them. But when it comes to processing, there is two components. There's the compute and then there's the communication. And what IBEX does is it provides a lot of compute, but as you increase the amount of compute, as you add GPUs to the mix, you are connecting them via slower communication channels, right? And so only if your workflows can benefit from these sorts of trade-offs, does it make sense to try and, you know, scale up. Now, fortunately, uh, deep learning pipelines are well-suited that there is a lot of parallelism there that we can take advantage of, a lot of independent processing that can be done. And it's only when we kind of need to combine, you know, the gradients and update the, the weights that we need to kind of communicate with each other. One of the assumptions of, of the question was that you could run the jobs on each of the three possible configurations. And so in that case, if you could run that job on one GPU, you, it would definitely be faster. Okay, because you are not making a trade-off for communication. It's only once you go beyond what's possible, when you go kind of to the impossible by scaling your work up to become too big for it to fit on one GPU, then you can start seeing uh, performance benefits by going to more. And only once you've kind of filled up what you can do on one node, if it doesn't fit anymore on one node, that you have to go to multiple nodes, that's when you start seeing the benefits. So um, what I'd like you to do is think of IBEX as powerful, um, but not as inherently fast. And so you have to work to convert that power into speed. And converting that power to performance involves scaling. And so that's what we're going to talk about now. The first technique to scale up performance is to scale up the batch size with the number of GPUs. Most and already mentioned this too. And basically we have a per GPU batch size that's that we have. So we've already tuned that for the one GPU case. And from our previous best practices, training materials, we have talked about the importance of filling up the memory of the GPU so that we are maximizing the compute utilization of that GPU. So, so GPUs are powerful. You need to give them lots of work to do. And that's done by increasing the batch size. So we'll have a per GPU batch size. But then as we add more GPUs, we have to scale up the total batch size, the total amount of data samples that we take from our data set up 
by that same factor, by the number of GPUs. And basically the reason for that is kind of the same reason that we want to keep one GPU busy. If we add two or three or N GPUs, we'll want to increase the total batch size by two or three or N to make sure that all the GPUs are also fully utilized. The other thing that's important when we try to scale is that the different GPUs have to be doing meaningfully different work. If they are all computing the same information, they are busy, but they are not producing anything, any information of additional value, right? So we have to ensure that each GPU has a different mini batch. And this means that we're going to have to split or shard the data set between the GPUs or the ranks, because with Horovod, you know, a GPU and a rank are kind of interchangeable. And we have to make sure that kind of each process has their own chunk of their data. If you're interested in some details that, that uh, in TensorFlow, there is documentation under the data set uh, under sharding. So there are some caveats to how we go about sharding the data set into these kind of GPU specific chunks. So the first thing is that we want to shard early in the data set uh, before we do any randomization. We want this to be a deterministic process, because once we randomize, we will no longer be sure that the set of data that each GPU has, the chunk that it has, is unique, that they may be a mixture of data that the GPUs share, there may be some data that none of the GPUs are going to see, so neither of those situations are, are ideal. We can do it early on and ensure that all the nodes see just their chunk of the data. We also want to shard on the file names, not on the data itself, because we can read the file names quite quickly, and then we can split up by those file names. We don't want to read the data in because then every rank or every GPU is basically duplicating work. So if you have eight GPUs, or eight tasks, you would be reading in your data set eight times if you were to shard the data after it was read. So what you want to do is you kind of want to split it up and files are a nice way to do that, and then read it in. And that way, the total amount of data read is just your entire data set. And it doesn't matter how many GPUs you have, the amount of data that you read remains the same. So this desirable property that you know, we can shard on the file names does mean that our data set should have some other desirable qualities. It's better to have more files than ranks. Okay, so if you're going to split the files between ranks, then it's better to have more files. And ideally, you know, the number of, uh, of files would be evenly divisible by, by the number of ranks. But if you have a moderately larger number, you can, you can still kind of split them around. You'll have some leftovers, and then you have to figure out what to do with those leftover files. So ideally, you don't. But if you do, what, what to do with those leftovers? Well, if you leave them out, then you're missing data that you could train on, and that could you know, hinder model accuracy. If you include them, it could end up maybe skewing your data set. You might end up seeing um, certain data, data multiple, more times than you might others. So this is why, you know, even before you start training, you want to make sure that your data set has these kind of nice shardable qualities, that it, it is easy to split it into the number of shards or chunks that you want. And then if you do have some leftover bits, that whatever is in those leftovers is kind of a, a, a random or, or a fairly representative sample of the entire data set. And then you can kind of split those around to, to the other GPUs. So here's an example of an efficient sharding strategy done in TensorFlow. So we will basically be splitting the data set between the workers, which is the, uh, the ranks of the GPUs. Our worker index is our global rank. And then we want to know the total number of workers because basically we will be dividing the entire data set into number of workers chunks, right? And then the worker index will be which one of those chunks belongs to us. So the first thing that we do is we list the files using whatever pattern that we have for our data set. And that file list just gives us uh, file names. It doesn't load the data. And there we shard based on the number of workers and the worker index and our worker index. And then we can go about loading that data, you know, shuffling it and interleaving it and whatever else that we do and, and loading it into the, the record data set that our training code will use. 
here's some examples of problematic code. So let's look at this first one. It looks fairly similar to the previous one, except that we start off instead of with um, you know a TF data uh, list files, it's now with the TF record directly and the input file. At this point, we're going to read in all the, the data. And now we're going to shard, take that, basically that data and just pull our piece out of it. Another a similar example is below where we kind of assume that we've already read in our data set. Maybe it's like an, an umpy load or something like that. And then we kind of split it up. So it shows a similar sort of problem as before where we have read our entire data set and therefore we read these data set multiple times across all the nodes and all the tasks. And that puts a lot of demands on the IO uh, file system. But there's another issue here as well. If we've done like a numpy load and we've loaded the whole data set into memory, it's entirely possible that that data set may just fit in the GPU. If the entire data set fits in the GPU, we are probably better with just one GPU, right? Because by spreading it around, we are introducing extra communication costs. So you may want to, th to think about, about that. Random thoughts about random shuffle. So another approach you might think about is, well, I'm going to read in the buffer. I'm going to have all of them read in the entire data set, but I'm just going to randomly shuffle it. So in this way, each of the GPUs will see different batches because they have been randomly sampled from the data set. And in this way, I'm getting them to to each do individual work. So um, that's one possibility, but we have to keep in, in mind a few issues. One is, is that the reads are gonna be sequential. And so, and only the buffer gets shuffled, not the read. And that means that we have to make sure that the buffer is big enough so that it's shuffling actually introduces sufficient randomization. So each um, rank is going to read in the entire data set, but then what's gonna happen is that, you know, normally when we go through the entire data set once that's an epoch, well, if we do this kind of technique and we have eight GPUs, then, then an epoch where we go through the entire data set would actually be kind of equivalent to eight epochs, really, because we're, we would have overall seen that data set uh, eight times for however many number of GPUs we have. And, and again, the advice given on the, the best practices previously to prefer using local reference data is going to help when we split up our data set between uh, the ranks and the nodes. So the nice thing about the local data is that it is local to that particular node. So let's say that you had a 64 GPU job, that that's eight GPUs per node, eight nodes. Each node would have maximum readers of the data be only eight, right? So it kind of reduces the maximum number of IO operations or, or users that can be um, hitting that, the file system um, at any one time um, because it's local. So you don't affect the global file system and each node processes just the IO for the GPUs on that node. So um, using the local reference data lets you do that. So we have made sure that all the GPUs are full, that they all have different batches um, so that they're each doing independent work. There's something else though that we can do to improve their performance and take advantage of what a larger batch size means as far as the information in the, the batch file. So what we can do is we can increase the learning rate by the number of GPUs. Two ways to go about doing this. There's the, uh, we can do it linearly. So we take our base learning rate, which was like for the one GPU case, and then we multiply it by the number of GPUs that are in this job. So experimentally, this is found to be good. There's probably limits to this, which we'll discuss shortly. The theoretical version is that we take the base learning rate times the square root of the number of GPUs. As we increase our batch size, this one may, may turn out to be to work a little bit better for us. So why does increasing the learning rate, why does it help speed up performance? Well, for one thing, a larger batch size has more samples. And so that makes the estimate that you get of the gradient more accurate. And when you have a more accurate gradient, then you're more likely to be pointed in the right direction. So you can kind of stay, take a longer, more confident step. And the other is that there's less noise. So if you think of 
let's say that you go through your uh, data set one example at a time, each example, the gradient that you'd get as to how to update your weights is going to point in different directions. And each, each one will have maybe its, its own direction. But the more examples that you add to your batch, the closer you get to the real gradients, the closer your estimate becomes. And that means that you can take larger steps. So to, to give an example of this on the, the bottom left, the blue example is, um, so we're kind of going through some arbitrary high dimensional learning space here. And with a you know, smaller batch size, with fewer samples there, there will be a lot of variance between them as to which way to update the uh, gradient. Now, in the end, if you think of all those little steps kind of add up uh, into a kind of a weighted contribution toward the actual direction you have to go, then the larger batch size, which has less noise and tends to point more or less closer to where the real minimum is, that there will be less noise, less variance, so you can take bigger steps in that direction. But there is a, a limit as to how far you can go with taking these bigger and bigger steps. Now, imagine if that your batch size has only 1% of the data and you double the batch size, but by two, two times. So you are getting a significant addition of more information about which direction to go. But if you had you know, 90%, let's say, or let's say even 50% or 60 or 90% of your, your batch size was the entire training set. Then doubling the amount of information there, if you even could, or just adding more information, there's kind of a, a, a reduction in the value of returns that you get from adding this additional information. So the chart at the right side kind of shows how, as you increase the batch size, you do get this linear component where yes, you do get really nice scaling because as you kind of you know double the, 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 the size, you're kind of essentially doubling the accuracy of the information. But at some point, the batch size becomes so large that it has most of the information about what direction you should go in already. Adding to that batch size doesn't really effectively increase the value of your gradient estimate. That's why you either want to, you know, maybe use the square root of the number of GPUs or be linear up to a certain point in the batch size and then just kind of a, a clamp of the learning rate. You know, we've increased the batch size to keep all the GPUs utilized. We've um, ensured that all the GPUs are seeing different parts of the data and we're doing it efficiently so we're not duplicating all the I.O. We're also increasing the learning rates so that we can take larger steps and get to our solution faster. But there are some caveats and issues to be aware of because as you increase the batch size, it becomes trickier to get the kind of uh, accuracy, both training and testing accuracy and the generalization that you would uh, normally expect out of like a single GPU job or, or a job with a smaller batch size. One of the techniques to improve the performance when you go for large batch sizes is to ramp up the learning rate from zero uh, fairly quickly up to your kind of plateau learning rate, which is the learning rate that you had scaled based off of the number of GPUs that you had. Some papers recommend within five epochs or you know, a few thousand samples, but you do want to kind of step batch by batch, increase that learning rate linearly to, until you get to your plateau learning rate. We will talk a little bit about why that might be the case. So you got the, the gradual warm up, or it's just the, the warm up phase. Then you hit your plateau, which is the, the kind of standard learning rate that you've adjusted for the, for the number of GPUs that you're using. But because you are using a larger learning rate, a larger step size, eventually, as you get closer to your minimum that you're trying to hit, you're going to need to reduce that or cool down that, that learning rate. So at the tail end of the training. So this is the tail end of the global training, not the tail end of like a job or, or you know, so many checkpoints. And that's basically just to ensure that you can get as close to the minima as you could when you were using the smaller learning rates. So you can kind of think that if you have a kind of a little bowl, a little minima, 
and you have a very large learning rate, so a large step size, and you get to that near that minimum very quickly. But because the step size is so big, you, you kind of end up never really getting that close to it. It kind of limits how close you can get. So by starting to take, once you get close enough, taking smaller steps, you can get much closer to your desired minimum. And, it, and that way you get the performance of large batches and large learning, higher learning rates, but you can also preserve your, your accuracy. Why do we need the, the warm-up step? So one reason is that it can help for some optimization algorithms. It can help uh, basically kind of warm up the momentum so that it's headed in the right direction before you take a really big step into, into your learning space. But the other is you know, kind of experimental is that without it, we see gradient collapse and failure of these large networks to be able to learn anything. We'll talk about why I think the warm-up, we'll give an example from a paper that proposes some solutions and shows what was happening to the gradients with and without warm-up. Why do we want this kind of this plateau stage? Well, so we can take larger steps to get to the minima faster and why cool down so that we can get closer to the minima. Okay, so here's an example from a paper. This one um, is proposing our, our atom, which I think had atom, so which had a um, warm-up built in. So the thing to notice is that if we look at the top graph, the uh, and we look at the training loss versus uh, the number of, of samples that we've seen so far, what we basically see is that without the warm-up, we will not be able to reduce our training loss to the levels that we would expect them. Techniques like our atom or just atom with warm-up let us basically reduce the loss close to the minimum we would normally get when we are not just doing distributed training. So example of what's kind of happening on the bottom chart, we see the number of iterations through the training. And what we see is that very quickly, the gradients, most of them are going to be very close to zero. And so we get gradient collapse. Whereas if we do the warm up, the gradient values tend to stay around reasonable values. And so we are going to update our weights and effectively learn. There are a variety of alternative optimizers that we can use that make it easier for us to scale up our batch sizes and learning rates. Some of them are self-adjusting for the step size and for momentum. There are some that have been designed specifically when we are doing distributed learning to be both efficient, but also to effectively learn even with large batch sizes. So some examples of these are our mess prop and Adam and Adagrad. Our Adam was the one that we saw previously that was basically Adam with, with automatic warm up. Two of interesting optimizers of note are Adasum, which, so Horovod is the uh, primary vehicle for this. It is designed to provide good convergence, even with large batch sizes, and it is kind of auto-tunes itself. Now, there are some issues uh, to keep in mind the performance of how the operations are done. Uh, it uses nickel for intranodes, so within a single node, it uses nickel, but for cross nodes, it's going to use MPI operations. And there's also some notes about the learning rate scaling that we need to kind of adjust based off of the number of nodes and, and GPUs. So if you're interested, you can look at, at that paper. Yeah, I think it's, it's part of, of, of Horovod. Another approach is LARS or layer-wise adaptive rate scaling. So compared to Adam and RMS Propt, it's using a, a separate learning rate for each layer. And the magnitude of the update is controlled with respect to, to the weight norms. So yes, so basically it's, it's a kind of a, a self-updating optimizer as well. And that has been you know, experimentally shown uh, to produce very good results. And we're able to train an AlexNet and ResNet with batch sizes up to 32,000 without accuracy loss. So that's, that's actually kind of a, a nice result. Another way that we can look at this is instead of going, you know, how big can we scale something? We can look at whatever computational budget is available and go, what is the best way to use this budget? And an example from a paper that was primarily on transformers, but it had some interesting insights into this. Their argument was that for a given computation budget, the best way to spend it 
is by increasing model size because larger models with, with larger models you get better sample efficiency so you can get more out of the data set with each epoch so basically you learn faster learn more and you learn it faster and this also means that you can stop the training early before before even before convergence or before you overfit which can also be beneficial for uh, generalization which we'll talk about in a bit then they found that increasing the data set size had only moderate impact. That's often tricky to do, but you know you can maybe do it through augmentation or a variety of other semi-supervised learning techniques to kind of see different aspects of the same data set. But typically increasing the data set, getting new data can be, can be expensive. And lastly, they found that model architectures seem to have the least impact. Okay, let's talk about another potential issue, performance issue that we could encounter when we try to scale up our uh, deep learning to larger batch sizes. And this is called the generalization gap. And what it seems to happen is that when you work with large batch sizes, it, you seem to be able to get you know, the same training accuracy, but not the same test accuracy. There seems to be more of a gap there. So, you know, compared to the smaller batch sizes, you get reduced generalization performance. What might cause this, this issue? Well, if you think of the kind of the learning of this loss surface, there's lots of local minimas. And fortunately, most of the local minimas are almost equivalently good as far as the training loss or training performance goes. So no matter which one of these local minima you fall down, they're kind of equally good for, for the training, but they have different kind of accuracy. If you think about the loss landscape, some of them may be very thin and deep. And that means that if we go away from even just a little bit from the, uh, you know, outside the data set, that we will go away, you know, quite drastically from the local minima, right? So what you'd like to have is kind of local minima that have kind of a, a flatter bottom so that even as you move kind of a little bit outside the training data into maybe the statistical space of the test data or other data that you might see, that the, the loss will remain reasonably low. What might be happening is that when you are training with smaller batch sizes and you have larger amounts of variance, you tend to wander around a bit and kind of explore the, the surface a little more thoroughly. And so if you happen to be in a very thin, narrow minima and you're wandering around, it's fairly likely that you will just kind of step aside and go into a, a neighboring minima and start exploring that minima. And so the minima that ends up capturing you will be the one that probably has the wider bottom, right? That's the one that's kind of hard to, harder to, to get out than the very narrow, thin minimas. When you train with larger batch sizes and then use the larger learning rates, so even without the larger learning rates, just the fact that the larger batches tend to be more accurate, they don't wander around the domain as much, you tend to kind of go for whatever the nearby minima is, and then you stay in it. And so if it's a very steep, deep minima, you get similar training accuracy, similar training loss, but not test accuracy. One way that we can deal with that, there's, there's some solutions proposed in, in this paper, is to continue the updates at the higher plateau learning rate for longer. So sometimes what will happen, or traditionally what will happen is that once in the test case, you start to see, you know, the loss kind of plateau, you will start decaying the learning rate so that you can kind of optimize into whatever kind of minima you're in. Um, but what they suggest is that you maintain this plateau, the plateau learning rate, the top learning rate, a little bit longer. And in part because these larger steps are going to help you escape that minima and find a local one. If if there's a local minima, uh, if you're in a thin, if you're in a kind of a thin, steep minima, and there is another minima nearby that's a little wider, has a wider basin of attraction, then if, if you happen to kind of still be looking around, jumping around in that neighborhood with this higher learning rate, you may get lucky and step into this better minima and then start exploring it. So in this way, you're kind of helping you know, find the minima that 
is a little harder to get out of. And so we keep this, this plateau learning rate just a little bit longer, and then we can cool it off. They also suggest a, a, another type of, of batch normalization scheme as well. We have looked at various aspects of performance, um, but both for, for, for speed and training accuracy and test accuracy. Another aspect that we can just be aware of it's more advanced is that we can do some operations more efficiently. So an example would be tensor, tensor fusion, where we combine multiple small tensors into a single large tensor and send that large tensor over the network. So our networks, so this, this helps speed the network transmission because our networks can send a single large packet faster than they can send lots of smaller packets. Another possibility is that we take the, the gradients and the weights that we want to update and we apply compression to them so that we don't have to send transfer as much data between the GPUs and between the different nodes. And there's uh, work being done at Coast, and so I shout out to one of the projects that's implementing these approaches here. So we've just discussed a variety of things that we can do to tune our training to take um, the most advantage of the resources, compute resources that we have, and to uh, scale them as effectively as possible. So a few other IBEX specific things having to do with how we uh, specify uh, the resources for the jobs. So we have seen some examples from uh, David's presentation of the typical uh, resource specifications we might have. I want to point out a few things but when we go and specify which GPUs and which nodes to get. It's important that when we distribute and have multiple GPUs and multiple devices working together, that they are roughly equivalent in terms of performance, because your performance is essentially going to be limited by the slowest GPU, the slowest device. What I'd recommend is that one of the constraints you use is GPU underscore AI. This is so that you will get on the, are the nodes that are best suited for distributed deep learning. They all have V100s, 32 gigs. They all have, they're all NV linked. They all have, you know, fast networking between them. There are some other nodes, um, not GPU AI ones that are also V100. And so if you end up with a mix of these, the faster V100s may have to wait for the other ones to be able to complete the batch and update um, the weights and the gradients. So that makes sure that you get on the right mix of hardware so that they're kind of performant and, and have similar performance as well. Other thing is that, you know, there can be communication issues, you know, with nickel and so on, where the job runs, the training codes run, the training happens, the GPU becomes busy for a bit, but then when they try to exchange the information, it just seems to hang. So there's a flag called nickel underscore debug. And if we set that to be equal to info in the job script, it will provide uh, additional information that can be helpful when trying to resolve or debug these issues. So one potential uh, utilization issue you might see is, you know, you run your job, it seems to be running, it stays running, but it doesn't, you don't see the epochs update as you would expect. You maybe expect to see the results faster um, than for a single GPU. And when you go and look in your monitoring tools, you see that the GPU is utilized like 100%. There's not even any bit of variation. So this could mean that the communication is blocked. So basically the GPUs are busy trying to send their data uh, between themselves. This nickel debug is info will help you debug that. So some other issues is that uh, when you go to uh, multi-node uh, distributed learning, uh, TensorBoard continues to work because TensorBoard is, is putting its data into one place and you have one reader, but the bouquet-based GPU monitoring dashboards that we have shown previously in the uh, best practices training, they will only show the first node. But that's actually not such a bad thing because the, the GPUs are synchronized, they will typically be indicative of the performance of all of them. If you're using like eight GPUs on one node and you see that the eight of them are well utilized and you see the kind of ebb and flow of, uh, of, of their utilization levels, you can kind of assume that the same is true for the other nodes as well. But you won't be able to see all your GPUs. 
And so finally, what I would say is if you are looking to, to scale up your training to multiple GPUs, to multiple nodes, and, and you, you know, you're using Horovod or even other tools, please engage with us. We are here to help. You can contact us either via email to raise a ticket or ask questions on Slack. There's the uh, Coast IBEX Slack. Uh, and there's the general and the GPU channel you can ask questions at. Uh, David has talked about the importance of kind of putting our, our training codes into a repository and kind of having a good project layout for them. And he has given examples of how to do this, uh, this example project. There, there's a link below. I also put it previously into the chat. You can go and look to help inform changes that you might make to, to your code and your project organization and repository. It really helps to have it in a repository because when you, you know, ask for help and you can just share your repository for, with us, we can kind of explore the issues for you on our own and we can kind of get started fairly quickly by just cloning your repository and working with that. These kind of best practices, both for the data science and for the deep learning, they kind of all mesh together and make it easier for us to help you. And in doing so, you can get on your way faster, you can get your training working sooner, and you can get results from your training sooner as well. So I would like to encourage you, if you have questions or you're, you're trying to do this, please engage us. We'd be interested to know, you know, both the sort of work you're doing and how you are finding performance scaling on, on IBEX, what issues you encounter, and helping you resolve those. So with that, I will turn it over back to Mosin, who has a little bit of a follow-up presentation and maybe just answer whatever questions are in the QA. So we have two questions. One is, why is it necessary for each rank to see the entire data set? So actually, that's not the case. You don't necessarily want that. Uh, but you do want all of them to see all the data set, right? So let's say that you have 10 files and eight GPUs and eight tasks. Each one of these GPUs would then see one of these data files. And that means that two of the data files would not be uh, used to train. So overall, each GPU is only seeing one tenth of that data, right? That's okay because the other GPUs are seeing a different slice. So overall, they are seeing most of the data set, okay? But in this case where we have 10 files and eight GPUs, there's two data files that are not being used, right? And so we are not getting any additional value out of them. They're just kind of, they're not doing anything, right? Maybe just make this case where we have, you know, eight data files and eight uh, GPUs. In that case, each, each GPU only sees one eighth of the data, okay? That's fine because overall, they all see all of the data. Okay, that's that's a great case. Let's take a case where we have a few more files, like 10 files, and we split them up, one file per GPU. Now there are two data files that are not being seen. So they don't provide any additional value. That would not be particularly good. So what we could do, we could maybe, you know, read those two and kind of randomly spread them out between the other GPUs. We could redo our, our data set so that it has a larger number of files and then there's less left over, right? Let's say we had 100 data files instead of 10, then it'd be easier to kind of split them up between all the GPUs. And then some of the GPUs would have a little bit of extra, right? And then they'd still be seeing all the data overall. Um, some GPUs might have a little bit of extra, or maybe you might duplicate some of the data just to kind of pad it out. But yeah, you, you do want to see as much of the data set as possible overall but each GPU only needs to kind of see its fraction. Did that help or confuse? Okay, perfect, thank you. So with that, if that's done, I will turn it over to uh, Mosin, who has a conclusion to this presentation. So take it away. Thanks, Kanan. So I have like very few slides on scaling and I've showed you before, um, it scales very well. But uh, you need to understand that uh, with uh, distributed deep learning, the catch is uh, that you need to keep the batch size uh, big. Um, and it is relative to the problem uh, that you're solving, obviously. In NLPs, you can go as high as uh, maybe uh, 512. 
um, on global pet size and uh, in, in images uh, doing some computer vision, we can go as high as, uh, as, high as uh, 32K as um, um, Glenn ensured. Um, this, this experiment shows that if you keep the batch size the same, the global batch size the same, and start throwing more GPUs on it, such that if every uh, uh, increase of GPU halves the batch size, so it's the best size, global best size doesn't change here. The efficiency uh, degra degrades very, very quickly. And uh, this is a no-no for running on uh, machines like Ibex because this is going to run very slow for you. And you will uh, look at it as a counterproductive outcome of your uh, uh, whole effort. So the idea is obviously to keep the global batch size uh, big enough and keep the memory of the single GPU full um, so that the utilization is kept high. So everyone is churning at around about 100% uh, uh, percent utilization. And there are two ways of doing it, obviously. One is to keep the batch size high per GPU. The other one is to pipeline the uh, batches such that um, GPU never starves. If you do that, you can see that the um, panel efficiency will plateau uh, on uh, up to as as uh, high as uh, um, eight nodes of V hundred. So essentially, um, that will um, be a productive outcome of uh, implementing our award. Um, from an additional uh, slides point of view, um, uh, Glendon did mention the. Experience exploratory nature of small batch sizes and mimicking it uh, for large batch sizes. And he also many, uh, he also mentioned uh, LARS as one of the techniques to um, maintain the uh, high accuracy when you're increasing the batch size because it's susceptible to uh, getting stuck in sharp minima, i.e. with uh, high, larger batch sizes and uh, has a tendency to not explore. So the test function starts seeing uh, degraded accuracy. Um, the major uh, implementation in Lars is that it is uh, not going to um, not going to impose the learning rate uh, all uh, for all the layers all the same. It will uh, first the algorithm will will first uh, calculate a score of each layer in terms of its susceptibility or sensitivity to a large learning rate, and then do the scaling accordingly uh, for that specific uh, layer. And uh, that actually, um, that actually, the outcome of it is that you can uh, go uh, for very large uh, batch sizes and still keep the accuracy high and this is an example of AlexNet with uh, Lars and warm-up um, included in, in the learning rate scheme. Um, conclusive, conclusively, to wrap up, uh, the motivations of use horror ward is, I mean, we are not uh, here um, uh, saying that uh, PyTorch distributed data parallel should not be used. It, it is a very good uh, tool to do the distributed deep learning when you're in PyTorch. Uh, but then again, there are other uh, frameworks which are more portable from framework to framework. If you uh, envisage yourself uh, moving from one framework to the other. Uh, the other uh, aspect is uh, that if you do need model parallelism, um, as uh, David mentioned, Microsoft Deep, Deep Speed is the tool for uh, you in that situation. Uh, there are other uh, frameworks like Cray ML plugin, NVIDIA's uh, Megatron for NLP. Um, that's uh, also there for uh, uh, large transformers uh, done in parallel uh, with model uh, parallelism onto multiple GPUs. Uh, um, Harvard supports multiple uh, deep learning frameworks, as uh, mentioned before. It has a richer API uh, than, um, I would say, distributed deep learning in PyTorch, uh, um, DDP in PyTorch, because sometimes you might uh, need to use custom ops. For instance, if you 
want to do some uh, aggregation uh, from multiple GPUs onto multi onto all the GPUs, like an all reduce uh, uh, during a forward pass, rather than just doing it in a backward uh, uh, propagation step. Then um, here you have an opportunity to use that API and do that uh, step um, and introduce that step. Um, uh, optionally, uh, you can act as as uh, Glendon mentioned, you can do. Uh, communication optimization in Horoward with a couple of lines. Um, let's say, for example, reducing the precision of uh, all reduced part, uh, and then the packing and unpacking will be the responsibility of Horoward, where you are going to send the FP16 and will be unpacked on the F FP32 side uh, on the target device. Uh, compression is also uh, possible. Uh, in horror ward out of the box. And uh, you have um, something called Addison, uh, which actually uh, switches the um, the summation or averaging of the, uh, the decision of summation or averaging of the weights depending on the orthogonality of the two weights. Uh, if they are orthogonal to each other, a summation would do. But if they are not orthogonal to each other, then uh, an average would be the choice there. One other aspect of Horward is its extensions. So uh, you can actually do the parallelization of your ETL stage, uh, extract, transform, and load stage that happens on CPUs, and uh, that is also integrated with Horoward, and uh, it is supported by something called Spark. Um, and uh, you can uh, parallelize uh, the hyperparameter optimization such that uh, you can actually start a whole engine, a scheduler, with, with multiple GPUs and each GPU runs uh, an experiment of the uh, hyperparameter optimization ensemble and it smartly st uh, steers through the parameter space such that the ones that are inconsequential will be stopped by the early stop. And uh, if that direction is uh, uh, non-consequential, it will change to the direction where the hyperparameters are more promising. Uh, that actually makes a lot of difference in speeding up your uh, uh, basically science um, on on a on a very precious resource. And since you guys are going to cloud, it will make much more uh, uh, sense to actually explore this territory as well. So Horoward uh, integrates uh, um, another schedulers or frameworks tool called uh, Raytune uh, into Horoward, and uh, you can use Raytune. Um, on uh, in, with the, from within horror ward, um, uh, we are hopefully we are going to uh, do a training on how to use uh, horror ward Raytune on ibex very soon. Um, I'm in the middle of preparing that. Um, and lastly, I have found uh, that horror ward is uh, a bit faster than PyTorch uh, DDP. Um, so I think. So this is an experiment. Again, it is the same uh, ResNet 50 training uh, with ImageNet. Uh, I'm keeping the uh, batch size uh, the same as per GPU. So the global batch size is 4096, uh, 4K, uh, and it is one for 10 epochs. Uh, the yellow shows the training time for uh, running with PyTorch DDP. And the same problem is then run with uh, Horvath. The granularity of uh, training versus validation loops is the same on both sides. And you can see on IBEX, it is almost half the time uh, it takes uh, to run it with Horoward versus without. So there, there is a catch uh, in terms of uh, uh, using Horoward uh, rather than DDP. Um, what might be the pros of using Horoward? Well, a speed up is one. Increasing the memory footprint is the other. Uh, it may become inevitable at some point uh, because of the model's uh, own size that you will need to use a model parallelism. Then Horoward is not your friend there because it is incapable at the moment of using or uh, doing Horoward, uh, the model parallelism. Um, cost optimization, so scale out on cheaper GPUs. So basically Horoward can deal with multiple protocols, communication protocols, may it be nickel or MPI or PCP, whichever is available. So basically, if your compute, uh, uh, if you have uh, access to 
cheaper GPUs, you can still scale out and make use of them and then uh, do a large batch uh, training onto uh, cheaper GPUs. And this actually applies to AWS's or, or cloud uh, resource that you're going to use. So think about that too. From a perspective of portability, Horowitz's uh, uh, implementation uh, is supported by SageMaker as well. You might have to tweak a little bit of your uh, script, but uh, by and large, the concepts are trans transferable. So the skill that you are using on IBEX or on AWS will be uh, kind of synonymous. That is a plus. Uh, the cons are to, um, it's challenging to sustain the accuracy at large uh, global batch size. So uh, innovative techniques need to be applied and large uh, is one of them. There is uh, um, an implementation in NVIDIA APEX called LARC, L-A-R-C. Um, with Horrorward, I was not that successful in applying, so I'm still working on it. And uh, uh, David and Glendon, uh, if, if you know of working um, uh, implementation, please do let us know. Uh, data management may require rethinking, which means uh, uh, which rank reads which part of the data. Uh, and introducing randomness, if introducing randomness is important for you, i.e. shuffling the data, then you might have to do that. Uh, um, you might have to do this uh, randomness uh, introduction in your data ingestion uh, manually. Um, uh, by and large, um, if you look at the um, how the data splitting is implemented, um, it, it is using the same distributed sampler from PyTorch and uh, repurposing the two arguments, uh, num replica and uh, local rank. Um, to to set the offsets where to start reading from from the data set for each rank. So that is sorted uh, at least at least in PyTorch, uh, but uh, you need to know what your GPU is uh, training on. Uh, communication bottle, bottlenecks may include a, um, a lack of RDMA and uh, for reasonable amount of uh, uh, time, uh, doing training in reasonable amount of time, maybe RDMA uh, is a, a, an important uh, feature to have. Um, wider jobs on IBEX are challenging to uh, schedule today, and that's why you are opting for, uh, most of you are opting for uh, cloud, uh, but there is a capacity increase coming in near future. So that was it on the, um, scaling part and the other best practices part. Any questions? Yeah, that, thanks, Mosin. So there's actually two questions, um, maybe for, for you or David, have to do with Singularity and Docker, uh, about using Singularity uh, and Docker with Horovod on IBEX. And it's also a question about uh, using Docker to assist with checkpointing. I'll just make yeah, a, few comments, a few comments about that, about, about containers in general. And, and Horovod. The, the, what containers are designed to solve is the environment isolation, uh, environment isolation problem, and, and then the portability problem. So ideally in a container, you package your whole software stack inside of a container, and then you know once it's there, you can kind of move it around wherever you want. What I have found is that, at least in, on, on IBEX, Conda is solving a lot of the same problems and for me, in some cases, it avoids extra complexity that containers bring with it. And this is, I think, for me, this has been true in when using Horovod, is that when, I, when I'm using Conda to manage my app stack and do my distributed training, I don't have to worry about the extra complexities of whether I'm going to use MPI that's installed inside the container or an MPI that's installed on the system. And, you know, these are kind of two, if you look into basically distributed deep learning and containers, you'll run into the kind of like, are you going to run, you know, MPI inside the container or rely on an MPI that exists on the host outside of the container. And there are some additional difficulties there. And for me with Conda, I understand what's going on. I'm using the MPI that's inside my Conda environment and I know how this kind of works together and I know that it works on IBEX. So I haven't really invested too much time in looking into containers um, on IBEX, whether it's Singularity 
or of course, if you're coming to Docker, if you want to use Docker, you have to convert the Docker image to a singularity image in order to run it on IBEX at present. And that has its own set of, uh, of extra uh, complexity that comes with it. So I have found that Conda can solve this problem for me. And so I haven't really spent too much time on containers with respect to Horva and deep distributed deep learning on IBEX. I know that Mosin has, and so I think Mosin can talk about um, some of the issues that he's encountered and the potential benefits and costs and that kind of thing. Right, so if your production uh, stack is uh, solid and uh, you know that uh, there is not much uh, change that is going to happen in it, um, then uh, um, basically uh, you may want to think about containers as well. And singularity, uh, there is a, there is a, uh, there is a repo uh, in, in Docker Hub we maintain, and uh, we have a Horovod container that we are hosting for public. Um, so now you have three, uh, uh, you have three ways of uh, uh, using Horovod. Um, one is the module file uh, that is available on uh, the system. The other one is Conda that uh, David mentioned uh, very elaborately in the training. And the third one is uh, the repository KRCCL slash uh, GPU, Horvard GPU, uh, tag name 0192, that's uh, 19.2, uh, 0.19.2. I've used it, uh, I've, I've shared it in. Uh, so, so Mosin, um, you send it to the panelist and. Uh, yes, you... I'm going to do it and so, right now. And the other thing is, is you said 0.19.2, or I didn't see a dot there. 0.19.2, but in the tag, I can't use dot, so it is 0.19. Um, if there is uh, a more appetite about uh, for new uh, horror ward uh, versions, we can certainly uh, make it available for everyone. Um, but there are three ways now. You can use the image with singularity, and uh, there is a page on uh, how to use Horoward. And I'll update that page and share the link with everyone on how to use Horoward with a container, a Horoward container. Cool, uh, thank you very much. So the, one of the, the second part of the question um, that was asked, and I think maybe it just a little bit of confusion about uh, what the, the containers do is that they ask, I think Docker is a good tool to checkpoint large scale distributed deep learning. So I don't think that the container helps in any way with, with the checkpoint. I, I'll, I'll take that uh, okay. question. I think uh, I know what the anonymous attendee is talking about. So uh, basically what uh, there are two kinds of, uh, uh, there are two kinds of uh, um, checkpointing available uh, there. Uh, one is the regular uh, checkpointing of the model that you are doing. So basically in your Python script, in your uh, training script, you are um, uh, manually adding uh, the areas where you would like to checkpoint your model after a number of epochs, for instance. Uh, there is another kind of checkpointing from the system side that is called the processor, uh, pr process checkpointing. So uh, your main training process that has started or main training processes those have started in, in the case of MPI run, uh, they can be checkpointed and migrated onto other resources that are available. And this is uh, uh, to increase the robustness of uh, production jobs. Uh, when training is running and you know that uh, your uh, algorithm is locked, you're introducing larger amount of data to it uh, as enterprise does. Uh, this is really handy. Uh, we don't support uh, um, uh, things like, uh, or modalities like CRU, uh, which works with Docker uh, on IBEX. We tried that and it requires root access, so we don't support that. On AWS, on a bare VM, you might be able to use that uh, if you are interested, uh, but uh, again, the the way checkpointing is manifested or thought about there is entirely different than the checkpointing of uh, the model that one thinks about. Yeah, so I hope I have answered your question and I'm sorry if the answer was a no, that you cannot do it on IBEX. Cool.
Awesome. That was the that was the question. Also, someone asked asked what singularity was. So that's basically it's yes. a container technology similar to Docker. But I thought maybe if you want to elaborate, that'd be great. Yes. So basically, we cannot run Docker at the moment because of the privileged uh, containers uh, usage uh, via Docker. Because uh, uh, Docker daemon requires root access. Um, uh, so we have uh, something called singularity. Singularity is a a uh, container platform and it understands the Docker images that are the OCI images, uh, open container initiative images. And you can repurpose the same image, hopefully, if it hasn't done anything in uh, uh, orthogonal to what uh, Singularity understands, you can uh, repurpose the same Docker image, um, pull it from the uh, uh, Docker repository, Docker Hub, and then uh, launch the uh, image into a container uh, um, with Singularity runtime. If you need any assistance with that, do let us know and uh, we'll work with you. Awesome. Okay, that seemed to answer. Any other questions that, um, that you have? When I, you can just raise your hand if to let us know that you're you know, trying to type something in. Or KSL also has a, um, a channel of YouTube videos that have a number of the presentations that they have given, um, a number of talks, a lot of interesting information there. The KVL one, uh, we have almost all our training this year has is now online. It's a great resource. Uh, David has been um, also adding a bunch of how-to videos showing you how to, you know, get started on IBEX with, uh, you know, small examples with um, PyTorch and other and Conda. And so there's a bunch of, you know, examples there, uh, videos, how-to videos. <clears throat> there's a longer training videos. And the nice thing with uh, YouTube is that you can also, you know, go through them faster than real time. You can process at one and a half, two times speed. And then when you get to something that's you're interested in, you can, you know, a pause and rewind and so on. So it's, it's a really valuable resource. Thank you everyone for attending. I wish you all the best. Hope your training goes well and quickly and um, gets good accuracy. So take care. Have a good, good one. Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye for now.